Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a slight uh, technical difficulty with uh, our speaker joining, but I think he's on now. Um, so uh, we should be good. But uh, if you have questions tonight uh, and you're watching on Facebook, uh, just post them in the comments section. And Chris, uh, Chris is monitoring these, and he will he will uh, feed them to our speaker. And uh, if you're watching on our uh, website, you can just email questions at neighboraster.org, and those will also go to Chris, and he will get those to Larry. Uh, so tonight, our speaker is Larry John. Um, if anybody doesn't know Larry, I, I think most people in the club know Larry, but Larry is uh, one of the founding members of the NAA back in uh, 1973, and uh, he's been a member for, I think it's over 40 what, 49 years now? So um, he's going to be speaking to us tonight about how how far are the stars. So Larry, if you're on, we will turn things over to you. Okay, so, uh, and, and I hope I'm able to transition okay to the, uh, to the PowerPoint. But anyway, so uh, how far are the stars? That, you know, the story of uh, our understanding of the size of the universe and how far away the planets are, how far away the stars are, how far away the galaxies are. The extent of the universe is, is really best told, at least uh, for the first part of it, by understanding the history of how we came to know and, and how the earliest people, the pioneers, the ancients, and then the medieval astronomers and modern astronomers uh, detected distances to various objects and kept the scale of the universe going and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, here we are. And um, we, we want in this presentation to get a sense of where we stand in the great scheme of things, in the scale of things, from the smallest to the largest, and uh, including humans somewhere in the middle. And um, so uh, we, we can look at, I hope you can read some of the figures, but it's just basically getting across the idea that, that you have, a, you know, in the kilometer range or miles, basically, uh, all the way, you know, down, you know, we're, we're, of course, a fraction of that, just a few meters or a few yards in, in size, all the way up to through the thousands of light years and millions of light years. And we'll briefly, though there's not a lot of time to do that, and it's not the focus, but just so we can get perspective go like inside, you know, so in other words, from, as they said in the old TV series, if you're old enough to remember, or the reboot of the series, if not that many years ago, that we will take you on a journey that reaches from the inner, well, Adam, not the inner mind, to the outer limits, at least of human understanding. So way back when, you know, and when they thought the earth was flat, <laughs> They pictured things like a great wheel, and and you uh, here's the pilgrim uh, uh, looking through the edge of the dome and seeing the wheels and cogs that turn the sky. But it's really many thousands of years ago already. Contrary to what some of us learned, I don't know if you all learned this, but I kept hearing in, in grade school that you know there were uh, a period. There was a period in the dark ages, as they would call it, or the middle ages, when they thought the earth was flat again, but really educated people have known for thousands of years that we were more a globe and have also sought to, you know, uh, determine the size of that, that globe. Uh, and it started with Eratosthenes and Eratosthenes uh, determined uh, way back in three, third century BC, determined a pretty good approximation of the size of the earth, of the radius of the earth. And what he did was he knew that there was a certain well uh, to his south, uh, a little further south, uh, but you know, a couple, few hundred miles to the south, where at, at noontime on June 21st, the sun shone straight down. So you see that in the diagram as well at Said Aswan. And then where he was at Alexandria, he sent somebody down there, you know, to, to, uh, to verify that. I don't think he traveled himself. But then he noted that the sun was at a certain angle, a skinny angle, but still not quite straight overhead, about seven degrees from overhead. 
uh, where he lived in Alexandria. So he was assuming that the sun's so far away that the rays are essentially parallel. So then he took that little angle between where uh, the sun was and where he was in Alexandria and where the sun was at the same time at noon in Aswan, about seven degrees, and recognizing that the distance between the two was 5,000 stadia, which uh, there's a little bit of disagreement how much the stadium was, but uh, about uh, 10, 20th of a mile, 10th of a mile, something like that. Uh, so great big stadium in Alexandria. So he calculated this, the, the Earth's radius and he got it fairly closely, actually, you know, 7,000 something miles, you know, 8,000 miles, within a couple of hundred miles, depending on how you define the stadium, which was amazing for really for ancient times. A little later on, Hipparchus determined the, uh, the distance to the moon by a, a somewhat similar offset of between Alexandria and Hellespont, but by doing it during a, a solar eclipse. So getting this little skinny angle and seeing the difference between uh, where the, the moon's shadow was during the eclipse, uh, several hundred miles away and where he was, he was able to get uh, a distance to the moon that was again within somewhat range. So, you know, 200,000 miles somewhere in that neighborhood. So that we then begin to get a scale, you know, as things go out away from the earth and into the solar system. And um, then uh, uh, Aristarchus a uh, hundred years or so later was able to determine a pretty decent distance to the sun. His distance calculation, or I mean, radius calculation for the earth wasn't as good as, as Eratosthenes, but still kind of within order of less than an order of magnitude, or, you know, just like a thousand miles off or something. But he de determined during the first quarter moon, uh, the angle between the sun and the moon and recognizing that the earth and the moon had to be at a right angle and measuring that that angle, that opposite angle, uh, and uh, was able then to determine uh, uh, relatively closely what this, the distance of the moon was. So we're going out, we're moving out, oops, away. Uh, Cassini in more modern times um, uh, used uh, something called parallax to determine the distance to, to Mars. Parallax is where you, you take, you can get the, uh, the same idea, the same concept in mind, if you take your finger and hold it in front of your eye and look at one through one eye at a time, blink, close one eye at a time, then the other, and you notice that it, it appears to change position relative to objects in the background. So uh, Cassini did the same thing with a parallax of Mars uh, on opposite sides of the Earth uh, and um, uh, by, by determining uh, the distance to the to uh, the relative distance between then between the the, uh, Earth, uh, the Mars and the Sun, uh, which we'll go into how you did that a little bit later. He got uh, a sense of the start to get a sense of the scale of the of the uh, solar system. So before we can know how the solar system is constructed, of course, we have to know you know it is, doesn't go back as many thousands of years to, to uh, know that the sun goes, uh, the earth goes around the sun rather than the sun goes around the earth. That doesn't, isn't quite as ancient as understanding that the earth is round and trying to determine the size of the sphere. And as recently as the, you know, late BC, you know, early centuries of AD, uh, many people thought, most people thought that the sun went around the earth but there were little discrepancies in the movement. And then the fact that some planets would seem to move backwards uh, for a while. Uh, so that made that uh, a very complicated. You couldn't just have a simple uh, uh, system of that. So Ptolemy created this system to explain all those complications of the motion that included these little circles within circles, these epicycles, as you see here. So it got really, really complicated. And you know, there's this principle in science the simplest possible explanation is better. So what can we do to get a better uh, understanding of how the planets are moving and how the earth is moving around the sun? So but then we had to create, you know, uh, if you're hungry, lots of donuts and marshmallows and things and create a model, a different model of the solar system, in other words. And it was Nicholas Copernicus, or the, if you, uh, the, in the Polish pronunciation, Mikolaj Kopernik, 
uh, in the 1500s that created, uh, that uh, thought of the idea of the, the Copernican system of the, the solar system being uh, the sun at the center or more or less the center uh, and then all the planets revolving around it. That went so much against the church's teaching at the time that he had that didn't have that published until posthumously. Uh, so after his death in 1543, uh, lest he come into, you know, uh, be excommunicated and possibly tortured and all sorts of things that we wouldn't enjoy. Uh, but then, so he created the uh, uh, the first uh, well well laid out description of how the solar system uh, went and you know what its structure was, the Copernican system, and then. Uh, Kepler refined it and, uh, oh, I, I skipped Galileo. We'll go into him in a minute, but Galileo uh, published uh, his, help pu publish and, and build on his works and so did Kepler. Galileo for actually having the audacity to publish things that went against the church, the Catholic church at the time, uh, while he was still alive, ended up being in prison or essentially in prison and under house arrest for many years. But then we, in order to know Distances in the solar system, such as you know, when Cassini uh, uh, was able to get relative distances of the different planets, Kepler had a number of laws. And the important one to know for that, if you simplify it down to the ba most basic simple equation, that the square of the period of a given planet is, is, is equal to or proportional to, depending on how, what the units are, is proportional to the size of the orbit or the semi-major axis, as you call it, and, and that kind of, you know, the mathematics of, of ellipses and hyperbolas and, uh, and uh, parabolas. So P squared is equal to, or depending on the units, proportional to A cubed. And that was able uh, enable Cassini to determine be, by, by Kepler's law, uh, what the distance of the sun was based on, and, and what the distance of to various planets were one, once he got that parallax of Mars. And uh, Galileo uh, also did uh, some determinations of distances such as to the, to the moon, which was, uh, to the sun, excuse me, which was extremely difficult because what he was using was just like the, the, the sun's reported position during the eclipses and other phenomena from one side of the earth to the other. And that's a really, really, pretty skinny rectangle or uh, uh, triangle to use with just the eye. But of course it helped that he, he was one of the first people to turn his telescopes that Hans Leperche and others invented and turn them on the sky so that then you could get more accurate views of things than just doing it with the eye. And so sometime later, uh, uh, during uh, a transit of Venus, James Cook, you know, at the, uh, 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 in the 1769 transit of Venus uh, was able to get a much more accurate picture of the, uh, of the uh, distance to, uh, of the distance of the sun. Here's one of his actual diagrams from the 1769 transit. And many of you remember that we had a pair of trends because they always, transits of Venus occur hundreds of years apart, but in pairs, only a few years apart. And some of us got to view each of these in the pair uh, just a couple of uh, decades back. So then what do we do to figure out the, the what seems like the fixed stars? Uh, how do we determine distances to those out there? I mean, we're using things like par you know, parallax within the solar system, you know, how things appear to move uh, be, uh, compared to the stars. Uh, to get solar system uh, distances, but how do we begin to dis determine, you know, and, and develop this thought that maybe the stars are, uh, the, are just sort of like the sun, but much, much farther away and get some idea of their distance? Well, uh, a previous diagram said, you know, this is not to scale. <laughs> well, this one's really, really not to scale because, but it's the idea of parallax again, that, that the a fixed star from one side of the Earth's orbit to the other, the Earth in June, say in the Earth in December, will seem to blink in you know, photographs that you take uh, six months apart. And that's a very, very skinny uh, uh, triangle that really couldn't be done very effectively. They tried it some in ancient times, but couldn't be done effectively until you had telescopes. 
But then when you, you did, then they were able to determine as, as early as the 19th century, a lot of distances to uh, nearby stars by how those stars seem to move against the fixed stars. So, but that only, especially at that time, you know, 18th, late 18th uh, century, 19th century, early 20th century, could only be used for a very limited number of stars, you know, a few hundred, then maybe up into a few thousand. How do you get more of a picture of going beyond, you know, what is the structure of our Milky Way? You know, is there a structure to space beyond the nearby uh, environment, the nearby neighborhood of the sun? So then they had to learn some things about how stars work. And a lot of it had to do with variable stars. There are two type, basic types of variable stars. There's those that, that vary because of, uh, they're a double star and one of them passes in front of another. Those are called eclipsing, usually eclipsing binaries. And then there are stars that actually do this thing of pulsating, of like they get bigger and redder, and then they contract again and get smaller and, and bluer. And they pulsate in, in uh, a pattern in a, uh, uh, a recurring period. And one of the major people who, the, Henrietta Swan Levitt, who discovered the relationship to a certain type of pulsating variable called Cepheids, was Henrietta Swan Levitt working under, uh, initially under Henry Pickering. Uh, he had a whole group of women working under him, but she uh, really moved to the forefront by, uh, in 1903 and 1912, publishing papers that showed that there was a relationship between um, the period, the, you know, the time between the peaks and the valleys of, of uh, the certain type of star, the Cepheid variables, and their actual magnitude, absolute magnitude, in other words, not just how bright they appeared, but what their actual brightness was. Uh, then if you could compare that to what their apparent seeming brightness was, you could get their distance, you know, by the, the amount that it had dimmed, the inverse square law. So she drew up charts and uh, she, uh, she published those important papers and including some found in, in globular clusters and uh, globular clusters that occurred to a number of people when she published these, these papers. Globular clusters uh, uh, the the uh, CPA variables in a given globular cluster should all be at about the same distance. So that prompted a man named Harlow Shapley uh, to, um, well, we'll get to him in a second. Uh, but one other way, excuse me, that you could determine the distance of stars was by the, the spectra of stars. So stars, in other words, have, uh, you know, the spectrum, the rainbow from prisms or, or diffraction gratings and in interrupting that spectrum, dark lines that indicate certain chemicals and, and the, the uh, pattern of those lines would determine what type of star you had. And the two men, A. Nair Hertzsprung and Henry Norris Russell in the early part of the 20th century over a few years developed a relationship and created a sequence of stars and classified them, and then created what they call the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or the color brightness graph, as it's sometimes called in basic astronomy texts, or you know, uh, uh, in the uh, you know when you're a beginning astronomer, uh, noting that those of the a certain class, as we were looking at before, a certain color or a certain temperature, therefore. Had, uh, uh, were related to their true, their intrinsic brightness. And there again, uh, with the ones that were too far away to, uh, to determine directly through a parallax, you could, with, you, with this relationship, uh, when they were in their you know, main period of life, so-called the main sequence, you could get from their absolute brightness then, and, and knowing their apparent brightness, you could get their distance. But you have, so then they tried to sort of, I mean, from a long time back, from almost ancient times, people thought, well, this thing that, that we see above the, uh, us, the Milky Way that stretches from horizon to horizon, if you're way out away from the lights, which you should get to sometime because around here uh, in, until uh, after, you know, 1980 or something in Naperville or most of DuPage County, you can't see the Milky Way at all. You have to get way out away from the lights. Well, they thought, well, this maybe this says something about maybe it's not just a, a pretty band. And once especially telescopes showed that there were individual stars and clusters in there, they thought maybe this is related somehow 
Uh, some people thought this was related somehow to a structure to the universe before they knew that there were separate galaxies, but the structure to our visible universe or what we would come to know as the Milky Way galaxy. So what Harlow Shapley did uh, in 1917, he took the work of Henrietta Leavitt and he uh, plotted uh, the, posi you know, the positions of globular clusters based on her work uh, on determining the distance to, to CPF variables in those globular clusters. And he arrayed it around the sky in sort of a three-dimensional look, or sometimes you'd flatten it out like this one and make it into a two-dimensional look. And he boldly asserted that globular clusters sort of formed the, the extent, kind of a sphere that gave an, a, the outskirts of the galaxy and that we were in, you know, this part that we see as a visible Milky Way, we were in kind of a flat part where perhaps most of the stars or at least most of the bright stars were and the globulars would give us a scale for our galaxy. And he seemed to be pretty close on his estimate of the size of the galaxy, except and, and it, it, it was off by like a factor of four, five, six, uh, that made the galaxy seem too big and that made it rub up against, you know, Andromeda galaxy and so on. Uh, but it turned out there were two types of sepia variables. So once they resolved that, they realized and that, re, you know, reconciled uh, the problems with with uh, uh, the, the theories that they were developing of, of other galaxies uh, beyond ours, that the spirals that we see out there like Andromeda were whole separate sort of island universes or galaxies like our own. And important to that work was, was Edwin Hubble. And he did two really, really uh, critical things in our understanding of how big and how far away objects are, including uh, the, uh, ex extent of the distance to, to other galaxies and, and verifying that they for sure weren't other were separate galaxies and not just sort of an illusion or somebody's theory that there were another galaxy uh, and also the structure of the universe. So in the earlier work that he did in the 1920s, he um, was able to, we'll go back to this in, in a minute, in 1923, he was able to resolve uh, on a really, really extra clear night, because uh, uh, some nights were not quite clear enough to do this. Uh, he was able to resolve CPU variables, individual stars with the 100 inch telescope on Mount Wilson in the Andromeda galaxy, nailing down for once and for all that Andromeda was another st whole star system like ours. And then as it alludes to, we'll look at it a minute, many years later, the Hubble telescope, of course, going far, far beyond what he did. But he did a second thing as, as astronomers were beginning to develop, you know, and he was one of the major ones uh, in, in the 30s, 40s, and so on. The idea that, uh, you know, the, uh, the structures of galaxies and different types of galaxies, classifications, uh, that, um, he uh, looked at the at spectra, as we saw before, spectra have lines in them, uh, and saw a, a thing called the Doppler effect. It's similar to, if you're not familiar with the Doppler effect as optics, it's not the exact same physical phenomenon, but it's similar to the, the uh, thing you experience of the audio or the sound Doppler effect that you get if a car horn or a train passes by and it's coming towards you and it just keeps a steady tone and goes and when it passes by you or even the, the, the shift in the whine of the tires if you go to uh, Indy 500 or something you'll hear that they go and then when they pass you they whine at a lower pitch so that something moving towards us is you know the waves are compressed in a different way with light than, than with sound, but they're compressed or blue shifted. When something is moving away from us, the lines are stretched, uh, the waves are stretched out or red shifted. So he determined uh, this, with the specter of those galaxies, uh, plotted uh, a fairly small number of galaxies. You can see his very first plot there depicted next to him. And uh, again, like, like somewhat like Harlow Shapley, made this tremendous, really tremendous leap uh, of you know boldly asserting that 
that there is a relationship between distance and um, and uh, the redshift, meaning that uh, the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us, and that therefore the universe may must be expanded. Interestingly enough, uh, interestingly enough uh, in 1919, in the general theory of relative 19. Uh, 60, excuse me, in the general theory of relativity, uh, given some credence by the 1919 eclipse, Einstein predicted in his just purely intellectual exercise about it and the theory of astronomy uh, and astrophysics that, that the universe should be expanding. And he found the idea so unsettling and nerve wracking that he created this, this cosmological constant, which he didn't really think had, know if it had any physical meaning to it, but in order to compensate, in order to de-accelerate the, the universe so that you would wipe out the expanding universe. Uh, so, he, so he plotted, uh, Hubble plotted distances and, uh, and velocity, recession velocity uh, away from us uh, and created uh, the, the, the first Hubble diagram, continually being refined more and more as time went on. Uh, so that event eventually it actually became a part of the distance scale, developing that, that uh, 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 relationship, that um, curve or straight line, at least if you go only a few hundred million, only a few hundred million light years out, uh, that uh, you could determine um, by, by a redshift where, where a galaxy was. And you could, they could start to get a sense of the distances to various galaxies in the, you know, in the nearby group, a few million, you know, a couple million to uh, less light years, uh, clusters like the Virgo cluster, you know, in the tens of millions of light years, and eventually start to determine the distances to galaxies in the hundreds of millions and even the billions of light years away based on this method. And in more recent times, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, you know, uh, from uh, uh, its surveys uh, working in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, did uh, thousands of images, uh, gaining uh, many, many thousands more views or images of galaxies and determining many, many thousands more uh, distances to galaxies and more to the structure of the universe. Than it, uh, than it had been done before Hubble. Um, also important to determining uh, distances um, is uh, a certain type of supernova. You know, again, at distances where uh, it was too far away to see individual stars, but that if we could see that a supernova called type 1A had gone off, um, then there was a, as it was, not as it was exploding, which happens usually very fast and they never usually catch it, as it takes only hours, but as it's dimming, depending on the curve of its dimming, that would be related to the actual brightness. And then again, seeing in that galaxy how bright it appeared to be, they could, by that relationship, they could get the distance to that galaxy. So there's two basic types of supernova, some where it's just a really, really gigantic star and it collapses and then just sort of rebounds and has a gigantic, just obliterates it, blows it to pieces. And then uh, there's the, the type 1A, which uh, where you have material uh, beginning to be yanked around a, uh, a white dwarf until it builds up more and more, builds up and builds up until it can't hold anymore, uh, you know, and, and, it, and gravity crushes in and causes an explosion. Uh, so just a, some view, a beautiful view of the, one of the Hubble deep fields. Uh, so summing this up in terms of how we determine scales, what's called sometimes yard sticks as you go up further and further in distance, and sometimes called candlesticks, because again, with, with certain things like a supernova, it's almost you know like you're you're determining the candle power of the, the object you're looking at. But parallax uh, could determine uh, nearby stars. Uh, and then, as we'll see in a moment, uh, recently some still in our kind of arm of the galaxy, but some farther of the Milky Way, farther and farther out stars up into the tens of thousands of light years away. And then you had to start to look at 
sepia variables that we described uh, describe with uh, uh, Henrietta Swan Levitt, followed up by by Harlow Shapley and determining the, uh, and then and then finally uh, uh, Hubble and determining the distances to uh, the the outermost fringes of our galaxy and to nearby galaxies. Then as you go further out, supernovae, and then finally the redshift relationship uh, based on the the distance meaning being the amount of redshift that the spectrum has. Recently, uh, ju just a couple of decades ago, uh, something called the Hipparchus mission, partly named after, you know, doing uh, uh, homage to uh, the astronomer Hipparchus, but spelled differently. Anyway, uh, did a tremendous mapping, finishing about 1997, I believe it was, uh, a, a cataloging of, you know, they had done cataloging with very little information of even as many as a million stars, but determining things like, accurate distances, you know, only in the thousands or tens of thousands, but by another whole scale of magnitude in the hundreds of thousands, the Hipparchus mission and a follow-up called Gaia, which is actually still ongoing, both launched by the European Space Agency, uh, did careful uh, cat cataloging, uh, including distance measurements for a huge number of stars in our section or our couple of arms of the galaxy. And then what did you need in order to determine uh, a more accurate distance within our solar system? Well, you needed radar, of course. And um, really not meaning, of course, radar O'Reilly, but rather something that started, I have to, I love to mention this and show a picture of this telescope because this is the telescope moved subsequently to uh, far away to Australia, but uh, in, this is how it looked when my parents saw it. And they told me about how you know, until they understood the, this history of radio astronomy, how the first radio telescope absolutely baffled neighbors like my parents uh, when Brody Reaver built it in Wheaton, Illinois, right over here, just eight miles from where I'm sitting. So radio telescopes could determine things uh, like um, uh, mapping arms of the galaxy far, far away, that you couldn't see because there'd be too much intervening dust, you know, too much dust in the way to see visible stars, but the radio, the radio rays could get through. And also within our solar system, you could get for the first time extremely accurate distances, you know, to like within feet, just like when they bounce the, radio, the uh, laser light off of the moon that Neil Armstrong set down on the corner cube reflector in 1969, they could get uh, distances to within just feet or meters to, to uh, Venus and other planets by, you know, they said, well, we can detect these, let's bounce them off of, of uh, objects in the solar system. So we, when we are looking out there though, remember we're also looking back in time. Now, does it mean that we are, we're not taking a trip in time but we're looking back in time because remember, light has a finite speed. Light does not move instantaneously. So we can look back, for example, a couple of seconds and we're, we're the travel time for light to the moon and back. In fact, you could hear it in the community, you could hear it as a frustrating delay that they were very patient with of a few seconds every time they, that mission control talked to the astronauts on the moon. But eight minutes away is the sun, then hours away are other planets in our solar system. And a light year is then defined not as the old version of, of uh, Star Wars uh, depicted it, because they, can, they thought a parsec is 3.26 light years, they knew that. So uh, Lucas and others thought, well, that must mean, you know, parsec is a unit of, of uh, time, but it's not, and neither is a light year. It's the distance that light travels in a year. So to the nearest star, just a few years, 4.3 light years, and thousands of light years, if you're talking about the farthest stars that we can measure accurately in our galaxy, millions of stars uh, to uh, the distance, the distance to, to uh, the nearest galaxy that's comparable to ours, uh, uh, 2 million light years away. So therefore, if we look at say a star, you know, that's 60 light years away, we're seeing light because it took 60 years to travel here. We're seeing light that's 60 years 
old. So if we, we could see something that was happening on a planet around it, it would be from 60 years ago. And when we look up at the Andromeda galaxy, we're not seeing as it, as it is now, we're seeing it as it was 2 million light years, uh, 2 million years ago. And at the farthest galaxies we can see billions of years ago. Well, so by the, since by the Big Bang theory, uh, that there was a certain moment in time when, and, and borne out by, you know, things like a background radiation, you know, a lot of evidence to support that. So it's much more than just a theory, but, but it, since we, it only is um, 15 billion, maybe 20 billion, somewhere in that range years since the universe began, there's kind of a, a limit to how far out we could observe. And in fact, in the latest speculation of what we would see, you know, if we could see out, uh, you know, more than 20 billion years ago, it would just be this sort of, uh, you know, the, the first few minutes, it wouldn't be stars anymore. So there's kind of an observable edge to the universe because light hasn't had time to get there from any stars or galaxies that are farther away, and they might be. So that doesn't mean the whole universe is 10, 15 or 20 billion years uh, uh, in radius, uh, uh, or, you know, at least the, there's an edge there, just what we can observe. So there might be, it might be infinite, and, or, or it might be, and that's kind of in the realm of speculation, but they also do, you know, the cosmologists and, and the theoretical physicists look at other possibilities, such as that the universe is finite but unbounded. Why did they say that? Well, because there's evidence that, you know, that space curves, we know that the space curves is the new, the newer uh, uh, definition of gravity, you know, since Einstein and proven by, uh, by recent experiments and, and started to be proven by 1919 eclipse even back then. So if light curves, then eventually is it curving what they call a closed curve, a positive, uh, a negative curve, or is it a positive curve? If it's a negative curve, it might come all the way back to us again if we sent out a beam of light. But then there would be no boundary because sort of like picturing it as a three and four dimensional version of how if you were on the Earth's surface, if you're only on the surface and you're a two dimensional being or whatever, there is no boundary there, but yet it has a finite size. So the really kind of far out concept, uh, but, um, but uh, there's, there's mathematics behind it. And then there's the possibility of infinite but bounded, which is even more esoteric and, and messy to try to, to uh, pick, visualize. But powers of 10 help us in giving a concept a shorthand, just as they do to math and helping us make calculations. They give, help give us a shorthand concept of scale because if you think about numbers like a billion, that's bad enough. I mean, a million, someone told me there were a million packages in a warehouse where I worked on in once, uh, a billion insects in a square mile of earth. But how do you even really get a grasp of, you know, billions or hundreds of billions and, and sort of have it in mind, have it something you can wrap your, your fingers around. So powers of 10 help, and they are just that the, the exponent on the number 10, the little number of the upper right, equals the number of zeros. Uh, so uh, in other words, if you remember in Forbidden Planet, <laughs> and everybody should see that as one of the great science fiction movies, pioneering one, 1956. I remember when it first came on television, we all watched, and the Krell Laboratory had gauges, and, and uh, Morbius played uh, by Walter Pidgeon said each gauge was 10 times the power of, of the last ones. And so he declared 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, 10. The power 10 raised almost literally to the power of infinity. So uh, putting it on a, a little chart, so one is 10 to the zero power, oh, okay. 10 is 10 to the first power, 100. You notice there are two zeros. So as I say, the exponent is the same as the number of zeros. You get up to 10 million and you've got seven zeros, 100 million, and you've got eight zeros or 10 to the eighth. A billion, you've got uh, nine zeros or 10 to, the, 10 to the ninth. And by the way, the number of Google that, that Google searches named after but spelled differently is 10 and 90 and 100 zeros and 10 to the 99th, which is often as far as you can calculate, uh, you know, with a, 
uh, uh, with um, you know, with a lot of calculating devices, it's such a gigantic number that it's hard to even scale that in terms of space and meaningful physical reality. Then we, we could go to the very small, because of course, if we really want to know our place in the universe, uh, and Zacharias Jansen, and there's some dispute about, he's, he's one of the people that's thought to be possibly be the inventor of the microscope, but in order to see small things, the human eye, <clears throat> So then we put a negative number on the, the power of 10. We'd say it's one tenth, one hundredth. The human eye can only see somewhere between, you know, one tenth and one hundredth of a millimeter. One hundredth is, I don't think that hard to see if you have contrast, but much harder if you have about the same color of things. But then, so then he had, you had to use the microscope, some, some uh, uh, instrument to be able to see smaller, just as we had to use the telescope to see farther and learn more about objects out there. And Leeuwenhoek um, was one of the major discoverers of the biology of very small things, microbes, microorganisms. So helping to give scale to the smallest cells and one cell and bacteria and so on. And then they had to invent electron microscopes to go beyond that to sort of the structure, you know, that the, there really are atoms or to look at viruses. And then when you want to go even smaller, so we're not talking about a millionth, but like in the billionth or, you know, trillionth or a quadrillionth of, of, a, of a meter, uh, you have to split the nucleus of an atom apart. You have to split the proton apart of places like Fermilab, uh, which still does experiments and was one of the pioneering accelerators, uh, though, of course, they didn't end up getting a superconducting super collider. They have one uh, sort of the next generation of high energy over there at CERN in Switzerland, but still doing important uh, research right over here a few miles away on the very, very small. So let's put ourselves, interestingly enough, that we are kind of squarely in the middle. Look at that and contemplate it for a minute between the very tiniest things like the atomic nucleus and the very biggest things like the size of a galaxy. So I don't know if that means something or if there's some uh, people have speculated philosophers and, and science of philosophy, science, philosophy of science teachers, you know, about whether there's some meaning to why uh, that is, but, D discovering things like this, the structure, the size of the universe, the scale of the universe certainly is sort of the universe almost kind of being sentient of, of discovering or understanding itself, isn't it? Okay, uh, then I, we're going to give this a try, I guess, right? <laughs> right, Jim, we said we would try this? Are you yes. there? Yep. Yeah. So um, if, if it doesn't work out for some reason, then you have homework to do and you will try it on YouTube on your own, but uh, this is said to be in the public domain. Well, let's just go to the homework <laughs> because uh, uh, it, we want to keep these meetings to a decent length anyway. I mean, these, uh, these talks to a decent length. Here is your homework. You are all therefore charged with the uh, uh, the assignment of looking at powers of 10, which is only nine minutes. Can you see that now? Yes, we can. You might uh, hit uh, present from current slide, the, the second one from the left on the top uh, menu bar. Oh, right. Oh, I forgot. From the from, from the current panel. slide. From, from no, current. Yeah, from current slide. Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's just scroll through really fast. This is the really fast version of it. Sorry. Okay. Almost there. We're past Gary. Uh, there we go. You can see that now, correct? Yes, correct. Can we see it? Yeah, where is it? Okay, so uh, so powers of ten, which takes us on a journey from the lakefront in Chicago out to the edge of the visible universe, but it leaves a little bit out because again, in 1977, they hadn't had Hubble, didn't know quite so much about deep, deep space and clusters at the edge of the universe. So I recommend as a follow-up to it, BBC's, the universe is so big, it's mind blowing. And that's also only a few minutes of your time, but very much well worth it. The Library of Cong Congress, in fact, decreed powers of 10 of great cultural and historic significance and, 
astronomical significance and what all else awarded to it from Library of Congress. So that is all I have to say. And you, uh, I'm well, I'm uh, uh, not averse to questions. I invite any questions that anybody has. Uh, at this moment, uh, Larry, we do not have any questions that I've seen. Okay. So that about wraps it. Okay. I'll give it just a, one more, a few more seconds here. Someone wants to put something in. I haven't seen it though. I appreciate the conversation and the presentation was interesting. I think that is it then, Larry. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Larry. You're welcome.